finished with that. But first and, and foremost, I'd like to again extend my deepest sympathies to the family of Michael Brown. As I've said in the past, I know uh, that regardless of the circumstances here, they lost a loved one to violence. And I know that the pain that accompanies such a loss knows no bounds. On August 9th, Michael Brown was shot and killed by police officer Darren Wilson. Within minutes, various accounts of the incident began appearing on social media, accounts filled with speculation and little, if any, solid, accurate information. Almost immediately, neighbors began gathering and anger began growing because of the various descriptions of what had happened and because of the underlying tension between the police department and a significant part of the neighborhood. The St. Louis County Police conducted an extensive investigation at the crime scene, at times under very trying circumstances, interrupted at least once by random gunfire. Beginning that day and continuing for the next three months, along with uh, the, they, along with the agents of the Federal Bureau of Investigation at the direction of Attorney General Eric Holder, located numerous individuals and gathered additional evidence and information. Fully aware of the unfounded but growing concern in some parts of our community that the investigation and review of this tragic death might not be full and fair, I decided immediately that all of the physical evidence gathered, all people claiming to have witnessed any part or all of the shooting, and any and all other related matters would be presented to the grand jury. Grand juries of 12 members of this community selected by a judge in May of this year, long before this shooting occurred. I would like uh, to briefly expand upon the unprecedented cooperation between the local and the federal authorities. When Attorney General Holder first announced the federal investigation just days after the shooting, he pledged that federal investigators would be working with local authorities as closely as possible at every step of the way and would follow the facts wherever they may take us. As General Holder and I both pledged, our separate investigations follow that trail of facts with no preconceived notion of where that journey would take us. Our only goal was that the, our investigation would be thorough and complete to give the grand jury, the Department of Justice, and ultimately the public all available evidence to make an informed decision. All evidence obtained by federal authorities was immediately shared with St. Louis County investigators. Likewise, all evidence gathered by St. Louis County Police was immediately shared with the federal investigators. Additionally, the Department of Justice conducted its own examination of all the physical evidence and performed its own autopsy. Another autopsy was performed at the request of the Brown family, and all of this information was also shared. Just as importantly, all testimony before the St. Louis County Grand Jury was immediately provided to the Department of Justice. So although the investigations are separate, both the local and the federal government have all of the same information and evidence. Our investigation and presentation of the evidence to the grand jury in St. Louis County has been completed. The most significant challenge encountered in this investigation has been the 24-hour news cycle and its insatiable appetite for something, for anything, to talk about, following closely behind with the nonstop rumors on social media. I recognize, of course, that the lack of accurate detail surrounding the shooting frustrates the media and the general public and helps breed suspicion among those already distrustful of the system. Yet those closely guarded details, especially about the physical evidence, give law enforcement a yardstick for measuring the truthfulness of witnesses. Eyewitness accounts must always be challenged and compared against the physical evidence. Many witnesses to the shooting of Michael Brown made statements inconsistent with other statements they made and also conflicting with the physical evidence. Some were completely refuted by the physical evidence. As an example, before the results of the private autopsy were released, witnesses on social media, during interviews with the media, and even during questioning by law enforcement, claimed that they saw Officer Wilson stand over Michael Brown and fire many rounds into his back. Others claimed that Officer Wilson shot Mr. Brown in the back as Mr. Brown was running away. However, once the autopsy findings were released showing that Michael Brown had not sustained any wound to the back of his body, no additional witnesses made such a claim, and several witnesses adjusted their stories in, sub in subsequent statements. Some even admitted that they did not witness the event at all, but merely repeated what they heard in the neighborhood or others or assumed had happened. 
Fortunately for the integrity of our investigation, almost all initial witness interviews, including those of Officer Wilson, were recorded. The statements and the testimony of most of the witnesses were presented to the grand jury before the autopsy results were released by the media and before several media outlets published information and reports that they received from a D.C. government official. The jurors were, therefore, prior to the time that released uh, information going public in the, in the and what followed uh, in, the, in the news cycle, the jurors were able to have already assessed the credibility of the witnesses, including those witnesses whose statements and testimony remained consistent throughout every interview and were consistent with the physical evidence in this case. My two assistants began presenting to the grand jury on August 20th. The evidence was presented in an organized and orderly manner. The jurors gave us a schedule of when they could meet. All 12 jurors were present for every session, and all 12 jurors heard every word of testimony and examined every item of evidence. Beginning August 20th and continuing until today, the grand jury worked tirelessly to examine and re-examine all of the testimony of the witnesses and all of the physical evidence. They were extremely engaged in the process, asking questions of every witness, requesting specific witnesses, requesting specific information, and asking for certain physical evidence. They met on 25 separate days in the last three months, heard more than 70 hours of testimony from about 60 witnesses, and reviewed hours and hours of recordings of media and law enforcement interviews by many of the witnesses who testified. They heard from three medical examiners and experts on blood, DNA, toxicology, firearms, and drug analysis. They examined hundreds of photographs, some of which they asked be taken. They examined various pieces of physical evidence. They were instructed on the law and presented with five indictments ranging from murder in the first degree to involuntary manslaughter. Their burden was to determine, based upon all of the evidence, if probable cause exists to believe that a crime was committed and that Darren Wilson is the person who committed that crime. There is no question, of course, that Darren Wilson caused the death of Michael Brown by shooting him, but the inquiry does not end there. The law authorizes a law enforcement officer to use deadly force in certain situations. The law also allows all people to use deadly force to defend themselves in certain situations. So the grand jury considered whether Wilson was the initial aggressor in this case, or whether he was, or whether there was probable cause to believe that Darren Wilson was authorized as a law enforcement officer to use deadly force in this situation, or if he acted in self-defense. I detail this for two reasons. First, so that everyone will know that, as promised by me and Attorney General Holder, there was a full investigation and presentation of all evidence and appropriate instruction of law to the jury, to the grand jury. Second, as a caution to those in and out of the media who will pounce on a single sentence or a single witness and decide what should have happened in this case based on that tiny bit of information. The duty of the grand jury is to separate fact from fiction. After a full and impartial and critical examination of all the evidence in the law and decide if that evidence supported the filing of any criminal charges against Darren Wilson. They accepted and completed this monumental responsibility in a conscientious and expeditious manner. It is important to note here and say again that they are the only people, the only people who have heard and examined every witness and every piece of evidence. They discussed and debated the evidence among themselves before arriving at their collective decision. After their exhaustive review of the evidence, the grand jury deliberated over two days, making their final decision. They determined that no probable cause exists to file any charge against Officer Wilson and returned a no true bill on each of the five indictments. No the physical and scientific evidence examined by the grand jury, combined with the witness statements supported and substantiated by that physical evidence, tells the accurate and tragic story of what happened. A very general synopsis of the testimony and the physical evidence presented to the grand jury follows. Please note that as I have promised, the evidence presented to the grand jury, with some exceptions, and the testimony of the witnesses called to the grand jury will be released at the conclusion of this statement. At a 
approximately 11.45 a.m. on Saturday, the 9th of August, Ferguson Police Officer Darren Wilson was dispatched to the North Winds apartment complex for an emergency involving a two-month-old... I've heard enough. 